And so what I want to talk about this morning, as you can see, is um, <clears throat> the commitment to courage. See, I believe commitment takes a whole heap of courage. And if we think about Remembrance Day, it's, we're remembering courage, aren't we? We're remembering the courage of soldiers, of people that have gone before us, of people that are serving in, out, outside Australia, even today, in the armed forces. It takes courage to do those things. And commitment to Jesus requires great courage. And so every one of you, every person in this room who confesses Jesus as Lord, I commend you. Well done. Well done. You are courageous people already. You've stood up in an age where faith is uh, devalued, where it's belittled, where it's berated, where people hate Christians in particular. One of the reasons that, we, that people went to war on our behalf was that, so that Australia wouldn't be ruled by foreign lands, that we wouldn't be reading from the Quran this morning instead of the Bible. There are all sorts of reasons why uh, those things happen and it took incredible courage. It takes courage to be a Christian now and it's going to take great courage to be a Christian tomorrow. And so whatever foundations we set for our children, they're going to need it. They're going to need everything we can give them and more because things are going to get tougher. Deb and I were talking about this yesterday as we were sitting out the back enjoying our favourite drink and just looking at the, it was a beautiful day yesterday as it is today. I'm surprised to see the church as full as it is, which is wonderful. But we were sitting there talking and just reflecting on some of this. And we are such a blessed people because of people that have gone before us, because of the legacy of people that have gone before us. We are such a blessed nation. And as believers, we also have a responsibility to be a blessing to the next generations. To our kids and grandkids, if you don't have kids, our friends and relatives, people around us. God's placed us here on this earth to leave something of value. And my friends, it will take great courage to do that. Things are not going to get better politically. Things are not going to get better. You know, we, we put our hope sometimes in politicians. I know that there's a whole bunch of Trumpites here in the church who love Donald Trump. I think Donald Trump's doing a great job as well. When you look at uh, the fact that he's gone to a midterm election and, and lost half as many seats as the previous president, that says a lot. And people laugh about him and whatever, and I'm not making an advertisement for Trump, but I already have it, I guess. Um, but it's taken great courage. He's gone against the tide. He's had news channels against him, and you know there was a, a, a reporter that he booted out of... Um, uh, the press gallery on just the other day, which took courage. And it's go we're going to... But politics isn't going to solve the problem for us. And so we've got to be careful that in putting our faith in people like that to a certain degree, that we're not sold out to them. Because they're just people. And Donald Trump is, a, is a, a man. He gets it wrong, he's brash and he's rough and there's all sorts of things about him that I don't like. And, and so we can't put our faith in politicians, no matter who they are. And as society turns away from God, the lives of true Christians will stand in greater contrast to the lives of others as time goes on. And that's the way it's meant to be. In fact, once we start blending in with the world, we cease to be salt and light. And we cease to have any influence in the world of any great uh, consequence. And so the truth is, we will encounter great battles and we will encounter great persecution as time moves on. The Bible predicts that. I'm not telling you anything new. The Christian life will require greater courage. Now, whether or not you believe in the, um, in the rapture, it's still going to get tough. It's still going to get tough. Things are going to get very tough before that time. And so courageous commitment to Jesus, his church, and his cause will be the thing that makes us different to everybody else. So I want to ask us the question this morning, what is so courageous about commitment? What's the deal about commitment that makes it so courageous? Well, in 2 Timothy 3, the Apostle Paul says to his young apprentice, 
Timothy, he says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Again, this is a prophetic word that Paul's having. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. And so as you read a passage like this, we start to think of the way the world's turning. But I'm not sure that that's what Paul was talking about. Because in verse 5, Paul indicates to Timothy that he's actually here talking to believers more than he's talking about the world, having a form of godliness but denying its power. I don't think the world has a form of godliness, nor do I think the world is trying to have a form of godliness. I think he's talking to the church here. And furthermore, because he finished that statement with have nothing to do with them, I become more convinced that he's talking about the church. Because that would otherwise be in conflict with the Great Commission, wouldn't it? Jesus sent us into the world to interact, to influence and to win people to Christ. So how can we do that if we have nothing to do with them? So I'm just using a little bit of logic here. I think he's talking about the church. The world will do what it does. The world just does what it does. It's all bad, basically. There's a whole lot of stuff that's bad. None of the traits listed in 2 Timothy were new to the audience that Paul was speaking to, in fact, when he wrote this letter. When you think about it, Roman society was already displaying all the traits listed here in 2 Timothy of godliness, of godlessness. In fact, archaeology has clearly revealed to us the complete depravity of the Roman society around the time that Paul wrote this letter. And so it wasn't prophetic in that sense if it related to the world. All those things were happening. The, the ruins of Pompeii are the greatest example we have of this, of absolute depravity of the Roman society. And yet Paul says here in verse 1, there will be terrible times in the last days. And this, again, is Paul speaking to the church. So all those things were happening when he spoke prophetically to Timothy. All those things of godlessness were happening. And Paul was really saying to Timothy, in the last days, even the church is going to turn to those things. Even the church is going to start displaying the traits of the world. And that's a sobering thought by any measure. And it should make us really take a second uh, check at this and to, to examine ourselves. Because we're actually starting to see this play out. The church of the last days is being inundated with the culture of the world. Again, we've got to be careful not to be judgmental because we're in this thing. And whenever we point one finger, there's three turning back at us, at least, depending on how many fingers you've got. Some people have got six, haven't they? Some people have got less. Some people have had accidents and, you know, whatever. <laughs> but the last days is being inundated with the culture of the world. And unless courageous believers make a stand, the church will continue to lose its potency. And we're seeing this happen, unfortunately. We're seeing the world now laughing at the church. You've only got to jump onto Twitter or read The Australian or The Herald Sun or whatever else other paper is reporting on the church. The world is looking at the church and going, if that's what God's all about, I don't want anything to do with that. Because this is no different to what we're doing. You know, when Bill Hybel said that the church is the only hope of the world, he was absolutely right. He was absolutely right. The reason I know that he was absolutely right is because, firstly, he came under attack himself. His own private life fell over and he's now no longer in ministry. You see, the devil knows that he was right. The devil knows Bill Hybel was right. And he put a big target on himself the moment he said that, the church is the only hope of the world. 
and we must, we must echo those words. And in doing so, we put a big target on us as well. And that's why it takes great courage to commit to Jesus. This is not something for the, for the weak at heart. I've had people tell me over the years that I couldn't become a Christian because all Christians are weak. Nothing could be further from the truth. You are some of the bravest people I know to be standing up and saying that Jesus Christ is Lord is brave today and it's going to be braver tomorrow. You see, the kind of commitment that God wants from us will require great courage. This is the kind of commitment that will resist the world and all its ideals and it will courageously uphold God's rule. And it's going to get harder. It's going to get harder. That's why, that's why we uh, must meet together. That's why Jesus said we shouldn't neglect meeting together. Paul's prophetic word to Timothy addresses this issue. And it's a call to the church to be courageous and uncompromising in our following of Jesus. To submit to his rule and to resist the ways of the world and uphold his truth and righteousness. We, we owe that to the world. We owe the world the very best that we can offer if we're the only hope of the world. You see, commitment to Christ is courageous because it's the same. It's akin to enlisting in war as came through with a prophetic word with um, Anthea this morning and Deb. The call to follow Jesus is the call to follow him all the way into ministry. This is not an insurance call. This is not life insurance. You didn't sign up so that you could escape death. You signed up because you were enlisted to war. You may not have realized that, but that's the truth. It's the most courageous commitment that you'll ever make. God has called us to prepare an end times church. Now, I'm not talking about preppers. I'm not talking about, you know, putting away your baked beans in the cupboard and building up a supply and, you know, building up a, an arsenal or anything like that. This is not what we're talking about, but God is calling us to prepare an end times church. And what that means is that we've got to start encouraging each other. We've got to know that our hearts need encouragement. We should be looking out for each other. We should be spurring each other onto good works. That was what Paul was doing when he spoke to Timothy in such ways. You see, for Timothy, it was obvious what talk Paul was talking about. And for the rest of the world, it was obvious. Because they could see those things playing out in the Roman world. And we can see it now. The only difference is history has conditioned us. We've been programmed, in a sense, by the world to shift the moral go goalposts. And so even Christians, when you talk about issues like abortion or you talk about issues such as premarital sex, there's all sorts of ideas out there. I would almost say if we polled the room this morning and asked what your opinion was on sex before marriage, probably a scary percentage of people would say it's okay. Well, I'm here to say it's not okay because the word of God says it's not okay. That's only one example. But you see, the goalposts are constantly shifting. And we have accommodated the goalposts. The recent marriage debate obviously was a very public demonstration of the division of the church. When you've got half the church with rainbow flags welcoming gay marriage throughout the whole discussion. And so that was a very public demonstration of, unfortunately, where a lot of the church is at. And so we've got to be different. We're preparing an end times church. That doesn't make us a cult. It doesn't mean that we're the only right church. It just means that we're one of the churches that's seen that there's a real problem going on here. And we've got to, we've got to stick to the thin line. We've got to go for the, for the middle of the game and we've got to uphold absolute truth. Even if we fail to live it out. Because, you know, when you uphold an ideal that's an ideal, It'll always be something you, that you aspire towards. And God gives us incredible grace when it comes to upholding his truth. Even when we fail to attain it, he gives us another chance and another chance and another chance. All we've got to do is keep up upholding it. And so it's going to take great courage to do that. 
I also believe that God promotes courageous commitment. God promotes that stuff. I'm not talking about, what do you think of the snail? I think he agrees with me. But God promotes courageous commitment. This doesn't mean that you're going to get a title or anything like that or you're going to be honoured or you know, put on a pedestal or anything like that, but you will be promoted. God will bless you. You'll, you'll, you, you'll be given bigger responsibilities. God says, if you're faithful with little, he'll give you more. And so that we, we need to believe that that's true. Most people like to think that they're coming up for a promotion at some point in their lives. I know when I was a young man, I was ambitious for promotions. And I wasn't happy unless I was the senior at whatever I did. I didn't realize that when you got there, the buck stops with you and there's nowhere else to go, man. You're it. When the wheels fall off, they all, all eyes turn to you. And so with promotion comes extra commitment. But God wants us to desire that. Not in an ambitious way, but in such a way that our commitment is rewarded with promotion. Because that's the kind of thing God wants to see. I believe as a local church, if we will uphold God's word, that he'll promote us. We'll grow in unusual ways. We're not going to grow by the manual. If you read the church manual, it's not great. When I say the manual, Kurong's full of it. The bookshops are full of it. Every author has a version of the manual, how to grow the church. And generally what they're on about is some kind of compromise with the world or something that's appealing to the selfishness of people to get them in the door. Ultimately, I mean, I'm being cynical, but you guys know it. You're probably on the same wavelength. Some of you are. Some of you are nodding. Some of you are saying, I'm done with this. The truth is that the responsibilities of leadership that follow promotion can be daunting unless we know that God is with us. And so the first thing that we've got to do is build our courage. Stick to the things that are, that are true. Adhere to the truth just like that snail going up the rock. Let me use Joshua as an example in Joshua chapter 1 and the first 10 verses. It says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is now dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan sorry, the Jordan River, into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Verse 8, do not let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. There it is again. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you for wherever you go. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people. We should be struck, and it's easy to be because it's obvious, we should be struck by the exhortation that God's giving here to be strong and courageous. And in one instance, to be very strong and courageous. He's reiterating the point. Because the fact is, whenever God promotes us or whenever there's a cause to be won, it's going to require people to break in and take the land. Joshua had already shown that he was courageous. And so God wasn't speaking to someone who was a coward. He was speaking to a courageous person already. There's a whole history that goes before these uh, statements in, in the first chapter of Joshua. For instance, in Exodus 17, 9, while others were questioning whether or not God was with the Israelites, 
Moses ordered Joshua to recruit some men and to go and fight the Amalekites. And so he'd already proven himself. In Exodus 17, 11, as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, on one, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. And then verse 13, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. And so we're not talking about a coward here. We're talking about someone that's already proven himself, has already received the promotion. And then again in Exodus 21, verse 13, when Moses set out with Joshua, his aid, and Moses went up on the mountain uh, of God. So Moses set out, went up to the mountain to receive the law, and the person he took was Joshua. Again, why would he do that? Because Joshua had proven himself. Moses felt safe to, to bring Joshua with him. And then again in Exodus 33, verse 11. And this is where the Lord met with, uh, Moses met with the Lord in the tabernacle. And it says in verse 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp and look at this, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the tent. You see, this was a man who was committed to God, courageously, to do whatever it took. Firstly, to meet with God and secondly, to do the job that was at hand that God had asked him to do. And so when the Lord spoke to Joshua in the first chapter of Joshua and told him to be very courageous, he wasn't unprepared. That wasn't a newsflash. He'd already started the journey. And when he received that instruction, it would have been, it would have been like manna from heaven. Because he'd sought God and he'd heard the voice of the Lord to say, be strong and courageous. You're on the right track. I like what you're doing. It was like the prophecies we received this morning and we receive most Sunday mornings. God says, I like what you're doing. Keep going. Be strong. Be ready to fight. Every now and then, God will just slap us back into line and give us another word that is a little bit less encouraging, but actually it's, it's encouraging in a way that is a bit different. It's encouraging as a parent is to a child when they do the wrong thing. And that's okay. And so he served an apprenticeship with Moses that prepared him for active service. It took commitment. Joshua was ready to be called upon. All he needed was to hear God saying, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be, be with you wherever you go. Now I believe this morning we're in the same boat. Again, if we did a survey of the room, the, last, the vast percentage of us, if we were to hear God say that, we'd puff our chest out and we'd flex our muscles and we'd set our vision on the goal that he'd given us and we'd go for it because it wouldn't be something new to, to us. This is how the life of a believer works. Jesus taught the same thing through the parable of the, of the talents. He said, if you're faithful with little, God will give you much. The men with the five and the two talents were able to increase their talents by 100%. We can see that in Matthew 25, two identical verses. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. You see, the truth is, folks, Courage represents the very best of humanity. You know when it says God created us in his image? We have fallen far short of the image of God in so many ways. We collectively as a human race have fallen so short of the image of God in many, many ways. And yet, when the stuff hits the fan, it's always courage that shines through, isn't it? It's always courage. And when you look at the, even through, throughout the different wars and 
conflicts where there have been Australians involved. Let, we'll just have a little bit of nationalist worship here for a little second. Australians have always put their shoulder to each other. And it would be no unusual thing to see people of different colour, different backgrounds, even different religions, standing with their shoulders to each other in the face of the enemy and laying their lives down for each other. That's what we do. I think Australians do it well, but really humans do it well. When you look around the world, that's what people do. When the chips are down, people start to gather together and we see the image of God at work. It may have been laying dormant for months or years, but when stuff goes south, as they say, human beings are at their very best. Human beings have always produced their best when persecuted or when their loved ones or even fellow human beings are under threat. We, we saw this again this week in Melbourne, didn't we? Anybody that hasn't heard about the thing hasn't been tuned into the world. But the terrorist attack that took place in Burke Street Mall on Friday, Saturday? Friday, wasn't it? Absolute horrendous stuff. And there's this guy wandering past that they still haven't caught up with. Nobody knows who he is. They just call him the trolley man. Happened to be walking past with a shopping trolley when this crazed uh, terrorist goes mad with a knife and the trolley man comes in and takes him out. Kaboom. And then the police are able to do their thing and it's all over. But that's what we do. When things go south, that's what human beings do. And Australians are great at this. We don't even think twice. We might, be the, we might think we're the biggest cowards in the world. And then when something happens like that, we're in the game and it's all on. And so that's what happened in Melbourne this week. But you see, we also have a real spiritual enemy who is armed and extremely dangerous. And he has his crosshairs fixed firmly on you. He's out to get you. He's out to get your friends and family. He hates you with a passion. He's the enemy of humanity and he's armed and dangerous. And unless we are fully committed to Christ, we're going to be of little use to God when, it comes, when the time comes. Because like Joshua, we won't be ready. Unless we've, unless we've served God well in the lead up to that time, we're going to go, well, what's going on here? What do we do now? Where's the boss? Where's Rob? You know, where's someone else? What do we do now? We can't be at that place. It's vitally important, guys, that we take this commitment thing to heart. I said a few weeks ago, I've never preached a sermon on commitment before, let alone a series. And largely I've not done that out of fear because I haven't wanted to offend people. I haven't wanted to let them think that we're out to get you to sign up on the next roster. And I don't care if you don't do that because somebody else will do it. There are plenty of people that will do those things. But you know what? We have to teach this stuff. We have to raise a church that's prepared for the end times and we can only do it by getting a church ready that's committed to the cause. Because less, unless we're fully committed to Christ, Christ, we are going to be of no use to God when things do head badly. I like this quote, pretty much because I like the guy who made the quote. You see, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. Don't you love it? John Wayne, some of you young people won't even know who I'm talking about. But he, he was around when Jesus was a little guy. John Wayne's pretty, pretty old. The truth is, commitment to Jesus is an investment in courage that God may draw on at any time. That's mine, by the way. You can have it. It's free. That's what commitment to Jesus does. It builds a bank account that we can draw on when the stuff goes south. It's as simple as that. And you never know when that's going to happen. We never know when disaster's going to strike. You never know when a loved one's going to die. You never know when things are going to happen like it happened in Burke Street this week. You never know when that's going to happen. The owner of the Pellegrini restaurant had no idea what was coming up that day. His family had no idea that when they woke up it was going to be a terrible day. 
We just do not know. And that's why commitment to Christ is so important. You see, as a pastor, often I'm dealing with people at the end of the disaster that have been, that have been hit by a surprise package like that. And they've all of a sudden had to deal with incredible grief or challenge or whatever it is that the world's thrown at them and they've not been prepared for it because they've not been committed to Christ and all of a sudden they've got nowhere to go. Now I'm happy to do that, that's my job. But I'm also saddened by it because it means that we're not preparing people well enough in the lead up to it. I like what Paul says here to Timothy in 2 Timothy. He says, I've been reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I'm now persuaded also lives in you. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity but a spirit of power, of love and of self-discipline. So Paul has equity with, with Timothy. There's been background, there's been relationship, there's been commissioning and affirmation and all the things that a father should do for a son. And then Paul says, I didn't give, God didn't give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love and of self-discipline. Verse 8, so, that, so do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, because you see guys, that really takes incredible courage. It's going to take more courage. It's really easy when, when things are happening and the question of faith comes up, which it often does these days in our workplaces or wherever we are, and we just kind of behave like a piece of Teflon we, or, a, or a wicket keeper that drops the ball. We just sort of, it, where is it? It's gone. We're out of there. We mustn't do that. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the, gospel, for the gospel by the power of God. You see, God doesn't call us to suffer for the gospel on our own. But it says there in the text, by the power of God. God will always give us that power. God gives his power to the courageous. He doesn't give it to the cowardly. Who, uh, verse 9, who has saved us and called... Where are we up to? Yes, verse 9 who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Verse 10, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's the heart of Christianity. Jesus went to the cross. It was an incredible act of courage. Now you might say, well, he was God. He knew what was the other side of the cross. And that's true. But nonetheless, death isn't a great thing to have to go through. Death is the absence of all life. And so Jesus entered the unknown. He went to a place that unless he went there, we would be absolutely destitute when it, came, when it comes to that time in our life. Jesus broke death open so that we don't have to be trapped by it. And then again, Paul says in Philippians 1, verse 12, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And so again, he's talking out of the weight of history, the weight of experience. Paul had so many things happen to him. He was in chains. Verse 13, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. This theme runs right throughout the scriptures. All the champions of the faith are credited with being courageous and fearless. The book of Hebrews has a, an almost endless list of champions who displayed absolute courage in the face of, the, of, of danger. And if, you, if we think that's just an Old Testament thing, Paul and the other apostles were constantly facing death. And as he says here, it's because 
of the sufferings of Paul, because of his change, his chains, I should say, that others were able to be more courageous and fearless. You see, those people make a way for us. And as I said right at the very beginning, God wants us to make a way for those that follow us, for our kids and grandkids and neighbours and everybody else around us. You are God's chosen person. He wants you to display courage. He wants us to be very courageous. I believe that half commitment in this world that we live in as a Christian would be more dangerous than being totally uncommitted physically because you're going to get smashed and it's going to require great courage to, to stand as a Christian in the coming years. And as a church, if we don't prepare for the end times, we're going to be left in all sorts of trouble. We can't afford to be an, an, uh, an entertainment church. We can't afford to be a church that addresses the popular issues and gives people what they want. We've got to be a church that's serving Jesus with everything that we have. And I believe we are. I believe God's forming us into that. I believe when new people come here now, they see something different. They go, you know what? I've visited a whole heap of churches. I don't even know that I want to sign up for this one. It's too hard. I don't know how many times we hear that, guys. People come here and say, this church is really hard to belong to. You know, there's a precedent for that in Acts chapter 2. The church grew like a mushroom. And at the same time, the people said, how can we join this thing? It's just too hard. I think that's the next manual. I'm going to write that book before someone else writes it. And so we, we, we've just got to stick to the game. We've got to be completely courageous. We're seeing some wonderful things happen in our midst as a church family. I think we're, we're in a great season. I think we have incredible hope and we're going to see some, some really good things happen. But you know what? It's going to take courageous people. Not just me, not just Deb, not just a few leaders, but it's going to take the whole family, whole kit and caboodle. So I'm asking you this morning, guys, will you be courageous? Will you stand? You have a pedigree of courage. If you were born in this country or you've adopted Australia as your own, and again, I don't want to be too nationalistic about this, you have a pedigree of courage already. And we should take that and run with it. Let's stand.